Hello friends, my name is Alex Krakus and I want to welcome you to the television series called The Mysteries of Monterey. Now today is going to be a fun journey. We're going to trek to a location where the Awaswa speaking people once lived. Generally speaking, we can say the Awaswas lived in the Santa Cruz Mountains and along the Pacific Coast. Their northern boundary was at a town that we today call Davenport, all the way south to a place called Soquel. So, I know today is going to be a very interesting journey because we're going to visit about eight different locations. So I invite you to come trek with me and let's gather some knowledge together. Well friends, before we continue our trek here into the Santa Cruz Mountains, I want to mention that two of my friends will accompany us on this journey. The first will be Joel Greger, who is a geologist, and James Doc Hale, who is an ethnobiologist. Well, the wonderful thing about having Doc Hale along on these journeys is his knowledge of the biological diversity of nature around us and its interaction, its relationship to the natives that once lived here. I tell you, I'm looking forward to some of the comments that Doc will make along this journey that we're going to take together. Pearly Everlasting uh, was one of the many plants utilized by the local Native Americans. If you crush the uh, flower heads and the floral parts, it has this beautiful, almost uh, maple syrup-like smell to it. And then if you look, you can actually gather the uh, seeds from the floral parts there. And this was made into a porridge and gruel and eaten. Very highly nutritious, uh, super high in protein, and an excellent carbo load. site is most likely a, uh, a village site based on the number of bedrock mortars that we found. 33, I think close to 40 have been recorded here. 
uh, if you use uh, E. Breck Parkman's uh, typology and model for uh, bedrock mortar village sites, uh, 20 or more suggest a village site. Friends before us are some interesting plants. These are known as vinegar weeds. Now I tell you what, as soon as I knelt down to show you these plants, I could smell vinegar in the air. I tell you, you know, this is really amazing because you always expect to smell vinegar out of a bottle, but smelling it in its natural state from a plant is really fantastic. Look at this. Uh, this is, these are the leaves of Quercus collagii, or the black oak. Uh, these are the largest oak leaves and uh, probably the most desirable of all the oak species that Native Americans utilized, uh, along with the tan oak. And uh, it produces a really huge oak acorn. And again, uh, like the tan oak, it's low in tannic acid and alkaloids, and so it was a very desirable uh, species uh, for consumption. So I found these leaves here, windblown. bedrock milling station where the two most desirable species of oaks were uh, processed by Native Americans. In this hand here with this uh, dentate oblong leaf and then the very characteristic uh, spiny uh, cups is the tan oak. And the tan oak is different than the true species of oaks such as the black oak here. And notice the deeply uh, lobed pinnate leaf of the black oak and again they both of these species were desired the most desirable uh, by the Native Americans as a food resource because they were low in tannic acid and other alkaloids and so required little processing much less than say the coast live oak and other species of oaks.
unfortunate. Uh, this is a hermit thrush, Catharus guttatus, that was probably killed trying to cross this busy uh, Skyline Boulevard. Uh, they're found in the understory and underbrush in the mixed evergreen forests here. You can see how beautifully marked they are and camouflaged with that speckled breast. And then that pointed beak tells you that it's an insectivore and also takes uh, some seeds as well for food. And you can see how beautiful uh, olive uh, drab and brownish colored uh, this bird is. Unfortunately, I say it was probably killed trying to cross uh, Highway uh, or Skyline Boulevard here. Well, friends, from here we're going to trek to another wonderful location. We're going to the Los Gatos Creek, which flows from the Santa Cruz Mountains as it meets the Lexington Reservoir. Now today, the Lexington Reservoir is under drought conditions. And to our advantage, it's at least 40 to 50 feet lower than its anticipated normal height level. Well, this gave us an advantage in a sense that it exposed an ancient Ohlone village site. So I tell you, this will be a very exciting journey. And I invite you to continue trekking with me. This is fantastic. I'm here at the Lexington Reservoir with my friends Joel and Doc Hale. While Joel and I were standing here, he looked down and this is what he saw. Look at this, my friends. I'll tell you what, this is really fantastic. This is a point. This is an arrowhead. And I'll tell you what, it's made from obsidian, so it was transported here because there's no local obsidian in this area. I'll tell you, this is really fantastic. My goodness, this area, the home of the ancients, still reveals its secrets to us. Friends, this is a fascinating ancient site. You can see the Lexington Reservoir here. It's very low now. Let me show you something. Right over here we have some trees. Can you see the light marks on the trees? That is how high the reservoir was at one time, but it's very low. But I tell you the incredible things is that it still reveals many ancient signs of life to us. Look at this stone over here. <laughs> it looks just like a regular stone, but I saw something unusual about it. And look at this. Look at the configuration right here. This is a typical ancient Indian grinding stone. Right here it's used on this side and on this side. Over here it's as smooth as a baby skin. And same on this side. So the action of the stone was to use it this way and also this way or sometimes it was used in this manner, back and forth, back and then again forth, used in a dual manner. And that's why you have this V-shaped configuration to this stone. I'll tell you, <laughs> this is fantastic. Look at this, this is beautiful. 
Well, we'll leave it here and hopefully it'll be here a thousand years from now. Well, friends, this trek that we've taken along the Lost Goddess Creek as it meets the Lexington Reservoir has been really exciting. I believe we found the site of an ancient Ohlone village. But one of the things that I noticed that adjacent to this village, there was another creek that flowed from the mountains. This creek is called Briggs Creek. And so I invite you to keep journeying with me as I continue to follow Briggs Creek to find further signs of ancient life. This is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere and look at this beautiful, what we'll call a gossip rock. It's a bedrock mortar area. And look at this over here. It's got close to 10, 11, maybe 12 mortars. Can you imagine the village woman sitting here and preparing their acorn? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14 areas. My goodness, this is wonderful. This is delightful. Friends, we're here at this site exploring, and look at this. Here's another boulder, and let me clear this over here. Okay, there you have it, another mortar. This is really fantastic. And right over here is a small, what we'll call, cupule or anvil. It's been a marvelous day trekking here in the Santa Cruz Mountains, but our journey here is not over yet. Because from here we're going to trek to the western slope of the mountains and we're going to visit a site where in 1892 a prominent judge built himself a cabin along this slope. Now this home today is listed on a National Historic Register site and it says that the home was primarily built from redwood timber and incorporated indigenous material. Well, I asked myself, what do they mean by indigenous material? Well, from my experience in the past, settlers often used the stones from the local area that they built their homes. The walls and the walkways often incorporated bedrock mortars that the ancients once used to process their food. 
Now you ask yourself, why would a settler build his home on a place where perhaps an Indian village once existed? Well, the answer is that that location was the most advantageous place for living. In other words, it was always near a source of water, and water is life. Well, friends, I've had a wonderful time journeying through the Santa Cruz Mountains, and I hope that you've enjoyed this trek with me. Well, before I sign off, I want to mention that the Ohlone people that lived here in the Santa Cruz Mountains were a hunter-gatherer type society. In other words, they moved according to the season, the weather patterns, and their food source. Now, also, I'd like to say that these people, the Ohlone people, are not a vanished race. They still live and prosper here amongst us. Well, anyways, I hope that you've enjoyed this trek and you continue to journey with me as we visit ancient sites that time has long forgotten. <laughs>